welcome to the barn blog and today is midterms day but we're not talking about that and we're not live um so i'm dating the the events we we talk about today just in case any other crazy shit happens with any of the groups we're talking about between now and about a month from now when this is released um so hi johnny hi happy to be here thanks for having me i'm glad to have you on um uh, for a long time, I've been a connoisseur of the Red Brown. And for those who don't know what that uh, hemorrhagic froth is, um, that is uh, Marxist, conservative alliance, traditionally fascist, although uh, with, with the groups we're talking about today, fascism may be too coherent for them. Um, uh you and I have followed, uh, you know, Marxist, Leninist, and other groups for a long time. Um, you tend to be a little bit more um, Marxist, Leninist friendly. I tend to be skeptical, but not hostile. Um, But we both noticed a trend about six months ago that freaked me out a little bit. Now, I didn't expect that the individuals that we're going to talk about tonight were going to ever come back. This was not the group that I foresaw people getting weird with. But I started noticing an attempt um, not to, you know, take elements of... the Russian geopolitical strategy seriously, but to kind of um, red wash Alexander Dugan, uh, a figure whose importance in actual Russia is actually really hard to gauge. Um, And then I started seeing weirder and weirder shit. And so did you. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Yeah. I, um, you know, uh, I was, you know, sort of tangential to some to some of this um, because I didn't. Um, I wasn't aware of uh, the the Larouche movement in particular outside of uh, you know vaguely remembering um, you know during the Obama years the Obama you know them kind of tailing protest movements and at Occupy um, with the you know kind of being an expression of uh, you know. Uh, you know, having Obama with the Hitler mustache and, you know, 9-11 truth and, and kind of going along those lines, but tailing, tailing those movements. And I didn't really have uh, a connection of the current, you know, iteration of it with the Schiller Institute um, and LaRouche Pack uh, to what was going on. So I, you know, um, some of these figures you know daniel burke is one um with the schiller institute i actually you know him and i were mutuals for a while because i you know there was some things about their program um that i you know i in in particular um the belt you know i i i see the belt and road initiative as a as a positive and they were tying those things together and so i didn't um quite make the jump until I followed, um, you know, really dug deeper. And um, I would think uh, the podcast Subliminal Jihad has a really good um, series on on the LaRouche movement, um, the history of it, um, as well as um, Daniel Donald Parkinson's, um, his uh his essay on uh, on LaRouche um of, like a warning to us all I think it's called on cosmonaut um and really seeing the scope of the history and then it, I had a cognitive dissonance with it and you know I just started to kind of post about it and um and then I became uh like a LaRouche uh apostate to them because we were mutuals and now uh you know i i I see them for what they are um and so yeah i i you know kind of intimately am familiar with the current iteration of what uh the larouche movement has become uh, as well as uh far more uh 
you know, familiar with the MAGA communism than I would ever like to be. <laughs> yeah, so we can talk a little bit about this. Um, I am familiar with the LaRousse movement because I believe I've been on the left just slightly longer than you, and I've been on the right too. And we always, on both sides, of the, actually on both sides of the political spectrum, they were always like one of the groups you mentioned, well... At least they're not that weird shit that happened in the <laughs> 60s to the 80s. Um, and how weird it gets. I mean, we're going to go down the rabbit hole a bit tonight. Um, but I had kind of assumed that during, you know, early Obama through Occupy, that that was like the last gasp of that movement. Um, I've known some former LaRoucheites. Actually, uh, in my audience, there's some people who were former LaRoucheites from a while back. Um, and what is interesting is that um, the attempt for LaRoucheites to adopt viewpoints and stances associated with the far right while also talking anti-imperialism as a pretty good game. Um, it, it goes back a while. Um, it goes back to at least the seventies, um, maybe a little earlier. And, you know, there's so many controversies around them. We're going to have to talk about operation mop up. We're going to have to talk about um, Frank Hauser and welder belt. We're going to have to talk about their attempt to like fuck around with labor unions um, the new the nineteen eighty New Hampshire presidential primary. I mean, it's an interesting thing because Larouche is, you know, not a household name, but actually not that far from it from a fringe former New Left figure, um, and yet also the fact that Larouche Pact and Schiller Institute both could come out seeming with a lot of money actually in the you know of yeah. recently. Um, Maybe not a lot by international standards, but a lot by former left weirdo standards. Right. Um, it, it is a little concerning. So, uh, I mean, I guess we we have to start at the beginning here, um, and then we'll kind of build to the current round. Um, what do you know about the man, the myth, the probable intelligence asset, Lyndon LaRouche? <laughs> Um, well, you know, I've, I've kind of been falling down the rabbit hole, um, with him and, um, you know, he started out ostensibly as, um, you know, some form of Marxist, uh, Trotskyist, um, and, uh, you know, was initially involved with, um, the, uh, the SDS and with, um, at, at Columbia where, you know, he was, kind of um known to to hang around um was was you know very active within the sds and represented kind of a faction of more um intellectually engaged uh you know as they saw it um you know marxism where they're you know he's having his people read kant and hegel and Leibniz, and um he's having them um you know dive into philosophy and Plato while, you know, the new left in which he, you know, saw himself as a foil against was, you know, ostensibly falling into counterculture. And um, so, you know, as, as the, you know, the sixties and seventies progressed, um, you know, it just, it just got weirder and weirder. And he, um, you know, at first he started kind of decrying a lot of, you know, uh, sort of what he saw as like mind control techniques. And then subsequently, you know, after, um, you know, going out of the country, he kind of came back and started implementing a lot of those techniques within his organization. Um, and that is around the early 70s. And that you know, he, there was even a, you, you can find a Washington Post article uh, prior to being owned by Bezos, um, where 
you know, he denied that they were doing these sort of like weird um, cultish mind control techniques um, while also like kind of providing evidence that he was doing it. Um, the, the audio transcripts he's seen uh, actually said increase the, increase the power at one time. Then he said it was uh, about the lights in the room and not like a kind of electro uh, mag, you know, some kind of electroshock, uh, you know, but he saw himself as a um, as a sort of uh, philosopher king. Um, he had an interest in cybernetics, and um, saw you know did management consultancy using both the language of um, of Marxism with this uh, you know kind of cybernetic management um, technique, and all of that kind of went into his particular flavor of Marxism um, that was really focused on um, productive productive capacity and technology and less about um, about labor power and more about you know having these the, his his acolytes become these like bourgeois managers of labor um, that know that have the uh, the right the right takes so that they're able to um, negotiate all these brainwashing techniques um, supposedly. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. He seems like if you, if you're familiar with technocracy Inc from the 1930s, um, which was a quasi socialist group that didn't pretend to be Marxist um, and that did some, actually, I think some interesting work on proto cybernetics and labor management uh, it sounds like in the '60s that that's really what he's trying to like bring into Trotskyism, but also with this dark, weird mind control element that right. that uh, that was outside of it. Um, you know, he he also gets involved. I mean, he was a consultant, which of course that that makes sense that he was in the cybernetic theory. There's a long history of Marxist consultants and cybernetics theory uh, but he didn't take the kind of uh let's say the the stafford beer you know empowering the workers view of cybernetics no. um so yeah i mean it, and he gets he, he gets involved in so many weird you know we talk about the sds but he's also like one of the major players in the attempt for u.s labor party um he is he's involved at one point in the Illinois Solidarity Party. Um, he he successfully ran candidates and primaries for the Democratic Party at, at one point. His own little form of the Justice Democrats for a while. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, but that was after his weird right wing <laughs> conversion. So it's I mean, it, it, trying to follow him is is wild. Um you know, in the mid seventies, you have all this ego stripping stuff, which, which I only recently looked into. I, I I more remember them as being this weird, like Marxist ally of Reagan shit from the eighties, and then I was going back and looking at the seventies controversies and going, what? Like it's even weirder than I thought. It, it's um, weirder than anybody could ever imagine. Yeah. <laughs> um. So. Um, what gets interesting is, you know, after this initial like 73, 74, uh, accusation of brainwashing, he starts deliberately doing outreach to far right groups. And he says he's doing it for intelligent gathering, but he seems to start immediately picking up their ideas. Um, right. And, um, you know, had, uh, you know, that's, that's the excuse for, um, I always try to reverse his name. He has two first names, uh, Roy Frankhauser, mm -hmm. um, with, who was a member of the American Nazi party and uh, then the uh, grand dragon in the KKK who he hired as the, um, the head of security for his organization. And, the the claim that the, um, that the Lurishites would make with that is that he was all because he was also an FBI agent. So they see him as that was one of their their assets on the inside 
who wasn't he was really a Nazi party member and a KKK member because his his intelligence asset uh, like trumped that. Um, but he was he was the Grand Dragon in the KKK American Nazi member party member. He was also an FBI informer, um, which is not uncommon in those groups. Uh, so yeah, he's part of how we know so much about George Lincoln Rockwell. As a side note, if you don't know who that is, you should look it up. So, but yeah, uh, and you know. Th- he also um, another individual that he hired for security, um, and I'm spacing on his name. Let me get him pulled up here because I have posted about it earlier. Was involved, um, who was an was an OSS officer, and it's the um, who did the training for his organization prior to the Operation Mop Up fiasco and all of that, which was. Um, one second. Um, Warbell. Um, Mitchell Warbell. So Mitchell Warbell was a member of the OSS. He was an OSS operator, mercenary, paramilitator, firearms engineer, and arms dealer um, who uh, shows up in all kinds of weird places, um, who uh, was a security advisor to the Batista regime in Cuba. Um, and you know there's a lot of these figures that larouche is just uh seems to be drawn to uh because you know uh, because he saw his organization the um the nclc as a as an independent um intelligence operation and so they had no qualms about working with intelligence operations um around the world uh certainly they did have some qualms about the the KGB. They, he thought that uh, you know one of the reason the ego stripping started was because one of their members um, said that he was brainwashed by the CIA to uh, become an assassin and, and and take down Larouche, and so they needed to do ego stripping to make sure that nobody else had the secret CIA sleeper agent. Um, programming uh, to become an assassin. Um, then subsequently goes and has his members train with literal assassins uh, and OSS members. Um, you know, he also uh, is, you know, NCLC cooperated with uh, South African um, intelligence to, um, you know, report anti-apartheid activists. I mean, just as you follow them through history, um, it's just one um, betrayal of the working class after another. Um, it almost seems like that's their entire purpose. Yeah, it's it does. I mean, it, it's interesting because you read, I don't know if you've ever read any of the LaRue's books, um, uh, many years ago, a friend of mine told me to read uh, Dialectical Economics, an introduction to Marx's political economy. Uh, By Lynn Lu- Marcus. Yeah. Yeah. Lynn Marcus, which is which is LaRouche, too. I mean, like it, LaRouche was one of these people who run under like 50 different pen names. Um, and that Lynn Marcus book is. Interesting. Um it, it does some things that I think are, are, are truly innovative. Like he tries to in, uh, in, um, innovate by including more mid 20th century anthropology and sociology into uh, Marxist political economy stuff that I think needs to be done. But you, you, even in that you start noticing this, this really large amount of business administration stuff in that book. Um, and, and it seems so, uh, by the end of it, just divorced from uh, from any notion of Marxism as I've known it. And it takes kind of a conspiratorial reductivist view on the British empiricist that is wild. Um, and there's also the fact that LaRouche starts really flirting with out and out anti-Semitism. Like that's, that's also something he seems to, uh, 
be attracted to. How did he justify that? Um, well, it's just he's not talking about Jewish people. He's talking about the British. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> um, that's I mean, that that's really um, and, and I don't I don't know if it's a, you know, a one for one. You can't um, every time he's talking about the British is not necessarily drawing from the anti-Semitism, but the anti-Semitism is such a strong strain right around the time that he's embracing American Nazi party members as, as his security people. Um, And, you know, I, you know, as far as his, is, you know, his own internal psychology has how he came to those, you know, he was, his father was a, you know, this kind of really interesting Quaker figure. Um, it, it comes from a really kind of weird background. Um, and his father may, you know, have had, uh, you know, a little bit of sympathy towards, uh, you know, the American Nazi party or not too, towards the, you know, Nazis in general. Um, and, you know, when you look at the way that he frames uh, history, you know, a lot of why it's really interesting to people is because he'll take um, a current issue and then, you know, talk about why this is actually because, um, you know, uh, because of, you know, in, you know, Babylonian times, um, or it's it's actually because, uh, you know, the pagan priest put, um, you know, Ishtar, uh, you know, worship into the Old Testament. And, um, you know, that's why that's, you know, it's not a, the real, you know, word of God, unlike Christianity, which has been purged, uh, purged of these more pagan or Gnostic, uh, you know, elements that he sees as satanic. Um, and so I think that is is kind of where it comes from is really, you know, he sees and, and speaks about the um, the Old Testament being manipulated by, you know, it's always manipulated by this, this, you know, shadowy cabal in the back. Um, so the, the um, even if you're subbing out, um, you know, Jewish people for British people, the overall structure of anti-Semitism is what informs um, the whole like body of his ideology. Yeah. Um, he may be the source of the first, like, so if, if you watch weird right-wing conspiracy theories now, if you've ever dealt with sovereign citizen people or, um, or even Alex Jones, there's a weird equivocation with queen conspiracies and anti-Semitic conspiracies. And I, I've always thought he may be one of the primary origins of that. Like, I don't, I don't know a lot of it before him. So we, we uh, he, LaRouche, and I will give them this. He is, he is, I would say, one of the most uh, influential political people within uh, American discourse, uh, un, unsung, um, because so many things that are now mainstream come from him. Russiagate, the original idea that that Trump, uh, Donald Trump, was a um, KGB asset. And like the initial uh, reporting on it drew from um, a lot of the LaRouche materials on that. Um, so, you know, and then going, you know, when you, on the Alex Jones side, I mean, you could, uh, I, I mean, there's not um, a single, it's, it's a cohesive worldview. I, that's completely wrong, but he, he they, um, tie it into itself and are able to um, pull these strains together um, through history so that, you know, you can see it really simplifies. It's like you really need to oppose this one thing. And that one thing isn't um, capitalism. It's not uh, the ruling, you know, it's not, it's not um, the appropriation of our labor power. Uh, it is this shadowy cabal that is preventing uh, the philosopher Kings from, from their true spot, uh, you know, in control. And so he had, you know, no problems working with 
um, you know, South, like I said, South African intelligence was also in contact with the Reagan administration um, because the uh, SDI was really, um, you know, that was his baby, his idea of the Star Wars Defense Initiative. And, you know, while obviously those technologies come up and that would have been a thing anyway, regardless, he had situated himself in such a way within the scientific community by being um, pro-nuclear and pro-fusion uh, power. Um, that he had a lot of sway among these sort of bureaucratic, uh, you know, ironically, the PMC um, types uh, that, that um, you know, they would now decry. That's he's his fusion. He had a newsletter or a magazine called Fusion. And uh, for a long time, uh, especially during the campaign for nuclear disarmament, um, that uh was a widely read among the scientific community magazine um, because they would tone down the more kind of uh, LaRouche elements and um, just heighten up what they want their audience to hear. And I think that's a lot of their strategy. It's, it's uh, you know, they, they're tailing the protest movement, whatever it is. So if it's uh, Occupy or if it's 9-11 Truth or if it's uh, MAGA, um, they want to be on the sidelines there with their their newspaper. Um, you know, there's that you know kind of classic Trotsky element there. <laughs> um, yeah, and what that's that. What is interesting to me about them is, it, it, you know, uh, both Trotsky and Malice groups have both traditionally produced a lot of right wingers, but there aren't any as weird or as influential or as cohesive for as long uh, as LaRouche. And by that, I mean, I mean, not that LaRouche's ideas are cohesive as we will talk more and more. They're absolutely batshit at points. Well, they're, I mean, they're self co. I mean, they're like <laughs> in self internally cohesive. Right. If you have an outside perspective, you can see <laughs> how that falls apart, but internally, um, they refer, they're hypertextual, they refer back, either there's a deep lore. And I think that's that's part of both um, uh, a draw to some of the, the neo-reactionary kind of MAGA communism in Infrared Collective in particular is having, building this kind of deep lore um, like the LaRouche movement does where um, they it's a series of, of buy-ins. You know, you need to you know, at first it's going to be, there's the surface elements, but you need to buy in to, you know, actually that's the Verdi tuning that's at the heart of everything or um, with some kind of the MAGA communism infrared that, that group, you know, there was a revival of Lysenko. Um, uh, dinosaurs don't exist. Um, I, you know, you could go down the wrist of the weird uh, ideological things that they start piecing together um, so that you have this very expansive worldview, and if you don't, um, if you don't get it, it's because you haven't done the research, right? You haven't um, read beyond psychoanalysis and the the myth of Marxian communism to know that you know uh, that Mar Karl Marx was actually uh, an agent of the you know, Venetian party uh, that actually controls uh, England and, you know, his, uh, you know, just all of this, this batshit crazy, you know, thinking that um, because of um, it's presented in kind of an erudite way um, with it seeming, you know, all of this historical backing, you know, it's like, uh, it's like Heidegger coming up with like ad weird etymologies out of nowhere that nobody can really verify, but because it's, it's old and sounds, uh, like it's, it's substantial, um, you know, it, 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 it sticks. And I think that's a lot of, of the staying powers. They build this mythology, um, that really, uh, you know, it, it augments the reality of the people involved in the in the cult, and they can kind of play along with this game. Well, one of the interesting things about LaRoucheism now is now that Trotskyism has kind of collapsed in on itself totally, um, and uh, is that, 
I mean, I know I have Trotskyist listeners going to be mad at me for saying that, but like every major Trotsky group that I've known about has either folded or become social democratic or key figures have defected, etc. cetera. Um, uh, I guess the, the, the hanger ons are uh, the, the a thousand uh, in the United States who basically keep Kasama Swat in office uh the the IMT which is having its own scandals right now and the Spartacist League which actually does a lot of the same weird shit as like the Rushites but it comes with none of the mystical mumbo jumbo or the intelligence asset element of it probably um most no like <laughs> key head <laughs> intelligence asset yeah right right um I, you know I, there have been times where i'm like if reading uh, uh, late 90s, early aughts, um, Spartacist papers going like with friends like these, who needs COINTELPRO? But yeah, I, uh, right around the, uh, you know, the Iraq war, I've there's some some really interesting um, critical support for Al Qaeda, critical support for ISIS. Yeah, 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 this. Um, <laughs> Yes. Yeah. It just, just, uh, very interesting positions that came up. That's like, yeah, that, um, whatever you say, officer, you know, am I free to, am I free to go or am I being detained? Um, yeah, it was. So what's interesting is you, you start getting, they start having legal trouble though, around 19, uh, ironically around 1984, um, uh, LaRouche, uh, falls a defamation suit against the uh, against the NBC network and the and the ADL. Um, it doesn't really go his way. In fact, uh, <laughs> it goes so poorly that there's now a a legal document and doctrine out of the fourth court of appeals called the LaRouche test um, for dismenting libel, defamation and defamation claims. <laughs> um, I did not know that. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I did, I did read that case, uh, <laughs> but I didn't, didn't know that it set a precedent. So yeah, it set a breaking, precedent. <laughs> breaking ground, you know, just really, like I said, uh, LaRouche has left an impact that, uh, you know, in a shadow, that is uh, very large in the American psyche. Um, so I will give him that. Um, it, it's not a, a good thing, but it's there. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, and it, you get into the weird stuff in the 80s too. I mean, one of the things is his AIDS initiative, which is, which is incredibly right wing, um, uh, which is basically, you know, uh, um, uh, internment camps for for people with AIDS. Uh, yeah, internment camps it, for people with AIDS, and maybe all LBGT people too, just to be on the yeah. safe side. Yeah, the, um, the yeah the uh, you know one thing that's very if you find recordings of Larouche, you know, it's not uh, you know shy with the homophobia um, and just really virulent um, like Christian dominionism that is inherent within. Um, that that whole like strain of thought um, and I think still continues uh, within the current groupings so we have, this is one of the fast this is one of the, the fascinating weirdnesses about this so uh, I'm more familiar from my from my studies with um, fourth positionism um, I had the the misfortune of uh, being an internet contactor of Mark Shabobda who uh, is one of the two translators for Alexander Dugan, refashioned himself after Dugan lost his position at University of Moscow as an RT journalist. He's an American, um, uh, a pretty far-right nationalist, um, although sometimes he tries to play something else. Um, and they did a lot of outreach in the, in the Occupy years, particularly to Americans who were foreign, who were anti-imperial driven. Uh, so, uh, like myself, uh, and then, uh, they reached out to the head of the, uh, everyone's favorite Marciite Trot party turned Stalinist party, uh, the, the workers world party. Uh, <laughs> we, I, I have to do, uh, on my intellectual genealogies, this would, this one's not, 
uh, nearly as salacious or weird as this, but the how did the two biggest parties of Marx of, of Marxist Leninism in America come out of Trotskyist parties? That's that's uh, that's a whole different fun. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, trip there's a lot, down, but yeah, there's, <laughs> yeah, a, there's lot. a lot there. Um, so I mean, I, I bring this up partly because I think people do have to realize after the new left started fragmenting, shit got weird across the board. Like, but LaRouche is special in that somehow you can buy Marxism, cybernetics theory, Christian dominionism, but it's like an esoteric Christian dominionism. So you, if when you're first attracted to it, may not be sold this. Um, there's definitely racialist elements to it, but again, you're not sold that amongst when you come in it, you, you come in with this ideas of like bureaucratic well, manage post trotskyism or something well i mean like if you want to be really fine you know fine haired you know detailed about it uh you know it definitely is is very racialist but they would see it as like a, a culture it's cultural supremacist right uh, because they're not speaking to like biological race but they're very much um you know uh chauvin cultural chauvinists um american cultural chauvinists for um and for not the, tra <laughs> the, the traditional fascist position actually unlike the hitlerites um which is which is spiritual and cultural racism as opposed to biological ones right but yeah um uh i find that's an interesting thing by the way uh duganist um Right wingers, right. uh, I, I would say the the same often applies. Yeah, uh, they do the same there. thing. Yeah, they do the and same so, thing. So they're they you know deconstruct the they're like oh no we're not Nazis no because we you know and I wouldn't say that you know all Duganists are Nazis is not what I'm saying at all but I you know they there is uh, a specific kind of cultural uh, that is is racial in a way, you know, they would tie it to that so do you know and... American revolt and American third positionism, uh, American uh, fourth position? Oh, I know, you know, uh, a, a, you know, fair deal, you know, my own sort of intellectual genealogy. I was an anarchist, uh, in my, you know, teenage years to like early twenties. We forgive um, you. You live in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, that's not where I, that's not where I adopted it. Uh, I, I, so, you know, but I, um, you know, and it was, it was, you know, a credit to credit or, you know, you can blame, you know, early zero books and diet soap and, um, you know, uh, I don't, I don't blame you in particular or, or Doug or anybody, but, you know, I, it was my exposure to that and kind of the blogosphere around that time around, um, uh, K-Punk, Mark Fisher mm -hmm. and, um, that that period of time that I started to um, move and uh, become more of a Marxist, um, although not quite the same, uh, more of like a council communist, left com um, kind of position. Um, and then um, I'd you know it'd say my my turn towards a more um, you know I more Marx Marxist Leninist position has been. Um, you know, since the failure of, uh, you know, the American social democratic movement, um, since, you know, uh, what I've seen post Bernie, um, from, you know, the post left, um, and this kind of turn that a lot of, uh, the internet sphere has, has this position, um, that I really, you know, I, I, just see as hollow because you know what turned me away from my anarchist positions you know aside from diet soap was seeing um a lot of what was going on um around that time with this like third positionist anarchism national anarchism yeah Troy, so Troy south Southgate. Gate. um and 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 that whole um shit and then you know when i did move up here to the pacific northwest seeing like going into my local anarchist bookstore and seeing that like Marxist section was like, maybe there's like a couple used bookstore books down here, but this occult section has like a whole shelf of Evola. 
And um, why is that? You know, what, what, what is it about, uh, you know, that particular strain of anarchism that was occurring that, that really lent itself to that? And that was what led me to um, reevaluate my position and, and do, you know, more thinking. Um, yeah, I was abroad at the, uh, during Occupy, as you know, um, but I remember during this time period, we before the rebirth of Marxism, we had started a, frankly, a, an academic Facebook group. It was just for um, Marxist, post-Marxist, and, and like um, socialist anarchists to talk uh, mainly about shit we learned in grad school. And we started getting infiltrated by people who were priorly associated with American third positionism under this rebranding of American revolt. And the reason why I bring that up is Pizarro, uh, not Dave Pizarro of, of philosophy podcast game, James Pizarro, uh, deliberately rebranded a lot of these far right, explicitly fascist groups to make appeals to national liberation um, and leftist in the beginning of the dissatisfaction with the Obama campaign. Um, and I remember this and I remember Dugan coming up a lot, Avola coming up a lot. Um, people say, you know, people bringing up, well, we're not, you know, X, where, Y. I started seeing corporatist and integralist brought up a lot, and and as well as like quasi right wing Catholic distributism. Um, I bring all this up because that's when I started thinking, oh, well, maybe this LaRouche stuff, maybe this is going to die with this stuff because Troy Southgate, you know, uh, and for people who don't know him, he was a he was a British. Um, a British National Front uh, leader who I believe in the late 80s immigrated to the United States, rebranded himself as a green quasi-primitivist anarchist in the post-left the first time around. Uh, I think it was like he wrote for Green Anarchy and right. out of U out of Eugene, which is where a lot of that stuff, um, or, yeah. you know, is is kind of situated. And for those of you who don't know, post left before 2019 had a completely different meaning, although still just as sketchy. Um, you know, you had to deal with Bob Black, uh, who it's inform uh, uh, another <laughs> police informant. Yeah. Um, and and I think the most popular figure um, to come out of that um, anarchist third positionist and really uh, to leave a lasting impact um, both. Um, within the radical sphere, and I could say, like, counterculture was Hakeem Bey. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Hakeem Bey um, hit it, you know, very well. Uh, well, not that well, but, you know, he was not very upfront with um, his kind of right leanings, but then um, in his, like, kind of poetic diatribes would reference, like, the March on Rome as, like, a an example of, like, a a temporary autonomous zone um, and that language of the you know a temporary autonomous zone comes from Hakim Bey and he um, you know you there was a period of time where you know a lot of this kind of burning man um, libertarianism you would find in like Silicon Valley you'd probably find Hakim Bey on their on their bookshelves probably with some Evola next to it um, as well as like a lot of the kind of Kevin Kelly wired uh you know sort of brand of libertarianism yeah this is this is an interesting point because i remember that i come out of a, a paleo conservative world moved left in the middle of the aughts moved really far left by the obama administration myself and was a i pretty much an instant left-wing critic of obama ended up a marxist um what i found fascinating uh, through that trip is some of those people didn't change, like a lady debonist would show up. Um, and uh, I, I always point out that, like, Pat Buchanan was actually at the anti globalization protest uh, in the battle for Seattle. That's actually the beginning of the brain worm that got me. Um, 
my warden trip to Seattle was for that as a very young man. Um, I've been in Seattle since then, but at that time, it's my it was my first uh, trip off the, the the East Coast even, and um, they were pretty good at that. And I remember Alex Jonesites really, you know, they would they. It's it's hard to imagine now actually, but but Alex Jones in the in the late aughts would have these kind of liminal left figures come on. Um, and, um, also Counterpunch, a magazine that I, I like today, and I know there's a lot of social Democrat fans of Alex Coburn, but Coburn was explicitly doing some of this towards the end of his life. He had been working with Israel Shamir, who was an anti-Semitic, uh, Russian agent explicitly. Um, and these things where there's this weird sort of sphere. And, you know, it was interesting. Johnny is during the beginning of the Trump administration, all this shit went radio silent. Well, yeah. <laughs> like, well, because it was, it was being mainstreamed in a lot of ways because right. that, that is um, what would then become like the, the alt right um, was a lot of these sort of, and the like, deniability was out after that point. Like you right. couldn't deny, like, like I remember at one point, and this is going to seem crazy to people now. I mean, uh, but the, at one point the alt right was trying to appeal to like, um, anarchists too, um, yeah. through this, through uh, I think this... I mean, that actually would be kind of the, the start of it was like, no, you know, this kind of like, we're anarcho, you know, we're, we're like we're post left anarchists, and that was like an opening of the door for them. Um, yep. And they uh, were able to, um, like you said, they you know a lot of uh, focus on national liberation, and they're like, well, you know, what else is a nation that could be liberated? Um, you know, white people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, but... it, it, you know, it, it. I think a lot of that energy um, then, yeah, what sucked up into the Trump campaign. Um, and the what became the alt right, and then through the kind of grinder of electoral politics, kind of is what it is today. Um, but I still think there's a lot of elements um, of those things um, in the current, um, you know, movement. Um, yeah, like a lot of the neo Larushites um, will will you know I've uh, what was it Ron Paul Maoism or uh, uh, lip, libertarian Stalinism. Yeah, I mean, it, it's people like the, the craziest stuff. They'll they'll fit they'll zoom in on a on an essay of Rothbart from the '60s where he encouraged libertarians to make common cause with with Marxist, Leninist, and Maoist because of their anti-state orientation, their anti-U.S. state orientation. Uh, interestingly enough, that essay I think it's uh, "Left and Right Prospects of Liberty" or something. Um, I read as a right winger, and I had noticed. Um, the, the von Mises Institute had actually edited all the references to siding with Stalinist out, but um, but had not edited all the references later on to siding with neo Confederates. So you could tell where they thought the the uh, what the they were worried was. about. Yeah, yeah, where the audience was at that point. But that's you started seeing people. I started seeing people recently again, like make these arguments, and I and I I started to really think like I've seen this kind of before. Um, like the way, uh, Green Greenwald and Matt TV have gone, hasn't totally surprised me because I saw them flirt with this during the, the beginning of the Obama administration, even though I would defend Glenn Greenwald against Democrats who would just call him racist whenever we report something horrible that Democrats did in Libya or something. I, I still um, get I still there's there's like some anarchists that remember uh, me defending Glenn, Glenn, Glenn Greenwald a few years ago. And I had somebody like just come up and be like, you're that Glenn Greenwald defender. And I'm like and I like sir, Google searched like, oh, I see I like my slight, you know, nudging defense that was just, uh, you know, because. Um, and uh, there's a lot of figures that are like that, that I've defended over the years. Jimmy Dore is another one um, who, uh, you know, has, um, they have very, Jimmy you know, Dore very I defended open... until COVID. Um, right, right, that was right. my breaking point with him. Yeah. Um, 
Well, uh, you know, I, I, I you know, I, it was also like his involve involvement and in, you know, kind of pushing a lot of the lava lava Jato investigations with, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, in Brazil. Um, but you know, the 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 thing is, like, uh, the reason why they you know gain traction, why they stick around, is because they are very willing to criticize um, the Democrats. And, and, you know, when a lot of people that ostensibly are, you know, on the left that, you know, social Democrats and and the DSA or, you know, people that that are, you know, like the social Democratic candidates that have been elected by the DSA um, are, you know, uh, not willing to, you know, not everybody, but a lot of but not willing to leverage those same critiques. Um, Jimmy Dore is willing to do that. But then at the same time, he turns around and is, is um, you know, un, you know, unwilling to be critical of people that, um, that are, um, you know, critics of the Democrats, like, you know, having um, LaRouche people on recently, Jackson Hankel, um and, you know, saying that as long as these people have geopolitical positions that I agree with, um, you know, I'm going to plat for them and that's good. Um, but, you know, what I would have a lot of people look at is, you know, um, if you look at the history, like, for example, with the, La- the LaRouchites and the Schiller Institute, like currently, you know, they're very like Z, you know, um, taking, you know, uh, the 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 Russian position, but um, it, all the way um, when it when it really mattered, um, when the Banderites were on the outs um, and did not have a ton of political power, um, the Larushites were the ones um, who were platforming them. Um, uh, 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 Ukrainian nationalists were at the opening of the British Schiller Institute. Um, they were also involved in. The, this, the Franklin investigation, um, this weird child abuse scandal that for some reason the LaRoucheites were very fixated on um, while uh, their vice presidential candidate was um, on that committee and was later uh, arrested for um, child molestation and incest <laughs> um, of his of his children. Um, so like, um, you know, they... Yeah, any 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 part of the revolution movement, I just like scratch a little bit, and then I start talking about it. It's like that sounds like the fucking craziest thing I've ever heard. Um, and yeah, it then... really does. You start <laughs> digging at all the people who've been indicted. Uh, like, <laughs> there's at least one murder, at least one. Uh, um... uh, Jer- Jeremiah Duggan, um, <laughs> who was uh, he was a um, British. Jewish member of the LaRouche Institute um, who found himself um, running into traffic uh, and got hit by a car, but um, right at a time that he was, um, you know, looking, having, having issues with the LaRouche movement and interpersonal drama within um, it's, it's a, it's a very, you know, yeah, it's a deep rabbit hole, which is, you know, it's it's been a little unnerving having, um, you know, a lot of these people uh, be really fixated and uh, focused on on you know me in particular. Um, you know, I've I've recently you know had uh, personal information put up, doxing, you know, um, just a a really. Um, concentrated effort to you know to stop me from being critical of um of the neo larushites um which i would say um the sort of maga communism is is under that same umbrella it's all yeah. under the same it's one thing um yeah at first i thought it was broaderism and and uh which now i think is being way 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 too generous um because Broderism isn't that, I mean, it's bad, but it's at least kind of left wing. Um, it's, it's, uh, and for those of you who don't know, that's the stance, like the, the social, the, the social patriotic stance of, um, the CPUSA in the fifties. Um, and that's what it looked like to me at first. I was like, well, this has been repudiated by the CPUSA itself. I wonder what they're going to do with it. Um, and it's annoying 
And then I started seeing Dugan Apologetia. And then I started actually also noticing what they were doing with Marxist categories. Because I would go down rabbit holes with them arguing about definitions. And I would like be pointing to this and this and this. For people who know about Barista Gate, that's when that happened in the public. But they've been doing this for a while, which is finding idiosyncratic uh, notes of Marx, taking them out of context, redefining terms. So, the, you know, for example, you might argue that the United States is not a capitalist country um, or, or some weird shit like this. Well, th this this is exactly their argument is that this we have uh, the Fabian socialists are actually who controls um, America. Uh, there's not, um, you know, and what the Suez socialist one guys. <laughs> and, and so, uh, you know, they, there's a lot of talk about, um, what, what we have now. And this is also, you know, very prevalent, um, among a lot of the kind of Claremont Institute people. Let's talk about neo, uh, neo feudalism. Um, and also among the, the neo reactionary set, um, and they 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 take this line of of neo feudalism, um, not just to say like oh you know con capital is concentrating in a way where you know that we're gonna have company store you know company towns and stuff again. I I, I mean that there's some legitimate legitimacy to that, but what they're basically saying is that um, you know we are regressing into a new neo, neo feudal order, and thus we need. Uh, more capitalism and development of productive forces to accelerate into communism um, or into, you know, what, uh, you know, uh, depending on what Lurushite you're talking to, um, you know, some would say just into, a, you know, they wouldn't use communism. Um, some are more explicitly anti-communist than others uh, in their rhetoric, although I would say it's all anti-communist um, in substance. Um, yeah, so the, what we've we've kind of gone on an interesting tangent, but that tangent is going to be useful later. Um, so in 1984, the Schiller Institute started in Germany uh, when Larousse marries the second wife, who's still alive and still involved. Um, I became really concerned when I started noticing. I've been noticing for a while, first with the post leftists, that Claremont Institute national conservatives were involved. And this, I think, there's more high profiles of this. I mean, you, you can see the kind of weird detente uh, at Compact Magazine and its ability to throw. And I mean, look, people I respect have written for Compact Magazine, unfortunately, but um, because it pays well, um, it pays well above market rate um, to some people and to even no names, it pays market rate. And it will publish like American Affairs before it. Uh, Decent social democratic critiques of uh, U.S. society and American liberalism, some of which is not even all that stupid or particularly right wing. However, um, it, what I found interesting about LaRouche coming back is it, it, it made it clear to me, oh, this is about a way for even the to to contain even the most extreme elements, quote unquote, from their perspective, from a from a from a uh, Claremont Institute perspective in back into the right somehow and right. into the, this, not into the center, right. We're not even dealing with like Trotsky, former Trotskyist neoconservatives right. into the farish right or the out and out far right. Now the Schiller Institute begins. Um, one of the interesting things about the Schiller Institute is it has promoted uh Election conspiracies, it, um, but it is fairly pro China. This is a position of going back to when Linus Relouch was alive. Um, although the China he was pro was, uh, almost on how bad the Sino Soviet split, split fucked up the Soviets, therefore China must be good. Um, grounds <laughs> right that, see, they, <laughs> they the sino soviet split is what um would make him uh you know a fan because <laughs> and it was any anybody uh who was anti-soviet um was given would be given a platform by the eir they interviewed stetsko um uh one of the the banderites and um 
you know, had, um, you know, the whole like frame of the, the um, interview is, you know, Lyndon Roosh is such a maligned character, just like your Stefan Bandera, um, you know, very maligned um, by these, you know, evil Russians. Um, and when you look at the Schiller Institute and a lot of um, what the underlying, you know, just weird mythology, you know, anti-Russian in particular is such a, such a, virulent strain within it um that they saw um the bolsheviks were actually you know that was um uh, they in particular used the word uh, it was a jewish golem of uh you know this venetian class uh that fascism and communism are and bolshevism are uh two two factions of the same um you know mythology um but the the anti-russian element um they would um you know kind of you know it's it's uh, about paganism and it's about this like oh it's not all this gnosticism and are these this weird esoteric reasons why um you know uh the german revolution um went astray and uh why the Russian revolution then followed. Um, they have a really strange like admiration for Rosa Luxemburg, like only Rosa Luxemburg, um, because they saw her as the only Marxist that, um, that understood um, the nature of production. And they, um, when you, they go to talk about World War II. So they're um, under consumptionist. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's not. Nor By the way, when I say I say it with contempt, but normally under consumptionism does not equal evil for my audience. Right. No. 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 It's 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 that that <laughs> like like that is not the core of the ideology there. Um, I would say it's a very very small fraction that doesn't really factor in that much. I don't really think that mean, the current Schiller Institute people are reading Rosa Luxemburg or inspired by her. I mean, um, it's interesting. I, I want I just want to point out the first Schiller Institute conference name for for a, a, a conference that's supposedly related to Marxism somehow. Um, uh, the first conference, which was held in November of 1985, Saint Augustine, the father of all european and african civilization that's the first conference right like um uh so i've got yeah, no. it, it, see his the, the the like psychosexual pathology like really loving saint augustine uh the kind of uh, you know uh <laughs> yeah anyway, yeah uh, <laughs> and then another interesting one is in 1990 and i think this actually is a forerunner of something we were seeing um they were a big pusher of of uh, Trans Eurasian or All Eurasian infrastructure programs, and 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 they were an early promoter, or a late promoter, depending on what standpoint of history you're looking at, of Eurasianism, um, because it was anti-Soviet. I mean, like, uh, which is, right. which, which was so wild to me when I I knew that something was wrong when I started encountering people who would later come out to be MAGA communists or Lurushites, but uh, a year ago were still claiming to be Marxist Leninist who were arguing pro Eurasianist positions. And I was like, I was just, I mean, I was just, I was shocked. Cause I'm like, I'm like, okay, I can get how maybe you can say, well, Dugan has a point on American imperialism and NATO. Right. Like, w w you know, every now and then, and no, I don't think Duganists are Nazis, but every now and then a Nazi says something true. Um, and then I got, uh, uh, from some of these same people, Dugan is an anti-fascist. And I was like, only in the Ukrainian sense, here's this article from 2012 where he's encouraging. And, and only, na only vote. now, yeah, o yeah, only now, uh, because yeah. I mean, you could look back and, um, you know, prior, prior to, um, you know, the last year or so he there was he he was you know very close friends with uh i'm forgetting her name but a uh, prominent ukrainian nationalist um you know and i would you know part of the sort of um the azov banderite ideology that came goes back to um they had uh 
it sort of started as a like a national anarchist uh yeah uh, gr- grouping uh to circle back um and so they have it's it, it all seems like a you know a pretty um you know a continuity um i don't think i think that the 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 change in geopolitical um position on dugan is p- purely opportunistic um that includes uh the current like pro-china stance because um historically his... he's not been pro-china at all no no and you know the the eurasian stance you know in the 80s and early 90s was that they need to break china up um and you know unite and the russia and Mongolia needs to go back to being russian like right <laughs> Yeah, or at least and, part of the Ruski Mir, if not out of, if not part of the Russian state, right? But. And and so those, I mean, those current geopolitical positions are not, um, you know, they're not coming from like a deep ideological commitment. They're coming um, purely from a, a like a current, you know, opportunism um, with the the geopolitical landscape as it stands today. And I think a lot of that's going to be tested, you know, as uh, right now their current um, you know, the, the neo Larushites, their last conference was uh, defeat green fascism. Um, while, you know, if you look at, um, you know, the last National Party Congress um, in China, their, you know, e- ecological civilization, and uh, they even put, made a post about the Belt and Road going green. Um, so I, I think there's a you know, there's a cognitive dissonance that they are currently dealing with, which, you know, either the off, the only answer I've seen is that um, China is just doing what the West wants for, for um, you know, public relations purposes. Um, so I actually want to ask you about that, because as we get into the neo Larushites and the Hazites and Infrahaz and all this modern stuff um, that has emerged, I, I want, I often mocked it <laughs> i used to call it our own art right um and by that i did not mean that they were nazis although apparently i probably should have maybe even held there out are, on that they, they, they welcome them you <laughs> yeah, know they welcome yeah. them more than they welcome anybody that identifies on the left right um, um, you know they've they've got uh was it nazi maoist uh what freak Franco Freda. Um, yeah, there's a there's a infrared Franco Freda fan that's like a. Uh, They're got... big defenders of national Bolsheviks too. Um, so I mean, it, it both in the traditional 1930s sense and in the Dugan's former party with Limonov sense. Um, I. But but to be to be more. Because I don't think that's true for everyone in there. And that's one of the pernicious no, things no, about absolutely. these groups um, is that unlike the alt-right, which took off its code around 2014, like it started feeling emboldened. Um, it started saying things outright. And, you know, sometimes I miss when all the fascists were talking in code. Um be, you know, I mean, we, we were looking for stuff like weird uses of diversity that actually mean something the opposite of that. Uh, diversity arguments for for uh, not nonviolent uh, ethnic cleansing, whatever that is. <laughs> um, but um, 2014, 2015, they took the mask off. Uh, but what I saw and what I what I initially was trying to say is. A lot of those people were either anarchists or they were right wingers who were trying to differentiate themselves from either the GOP or from normal liberal anarchist and the green weirdos like Sarazen. Um, uh, sorry, my Sarazen fan listeners, all one of you this left. Um, so, why are uh, you on a computer? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Um, go go live in a hut somewhere and await the ecological collapse. It'll not, well, about ninety nine point nine percent. Of the population, and also, I think you're supposed to lobotomize yourself, according to that one essay. Uh, oh, that uh, I, I, I actually asked Sarah's, and you may remember this. We asked uh, Doug and I asked Sarah's, and if he recounted it, recanted it, and he did not. So, um, 
Um, and that was the argument that you needed to get rid of the frontal cortex to get rid of reification. Lang yeah, language, <laughs> language, yeah. and re just the use of language is reification. <laughs> yeah, which I, uh, you know, I, some some folks that uh, you know maybe did too many psychedelics were into it for a while but yeah uh, yeah way too many psychedelics if you're, <laughs> if you're into that um so lo and behold we've talked about the craziness and, and the craziness in the 80s needs to be put in perspective larouche had will power it comes falling down in the 90s uh, he he starts messing with stuff abroad increasingly. That's why the Schiller Institutes are largely based in Europe. Then his his wife, but also he was in constant legal trouble in the United States. Um, yeah, then he, he got, dies. So well, when he got arrested, um, it was for fraud, and I was like part of their their fundraising operation, sort of like uh, you know, uh, like evangelical televangelist which is ironic because then he was put uh his cellmate was jim baker uh when he went into jail um the the televangelist and i think that uh that also then informed his um you that, know, is not, that is not surprising at all <laughs> <laughs> but um like man this so man the, ends up falling like he isn't he kind of fucks his way in like fucks his up his way into periods of world historical importance over and over again um uh, and you know i won't say i know he was a was was an intelligence asset but damn is it hard to he's one of the few right. people where i mean like, like that's like one of them seem true <laughs> right. I mean, like, that's one of those things you, you'll never really get a really positive affirmation of, you know, like, unless <laughs> unless somebody goes in and and steals the file cabinet, like, you know, uh, how the, a lot of the COINTEL documents came out, like, uh, you're not you're not going to get like a really, you know, positive affirmation. So really, you can look at like, what is the function of this organization? Like, what 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 does it do functionally? And even if he was not. um like literally an intelligence asset, which I believe that he was, um, I, he served their function of um, disrupting the left um, and scooping people up and making a pipeline um, to the far right. And I think that's the same, uh, you know, function that he does today. He's like a little uh, Mobius strip that just flips people over and brings them back over to the right hand side um yeah i mean he doesn't just do it in the united states too i mean one of the mo right. more fascinating periods of this of this time period is during his uh his hanging out in europe and going to russia a lot and after in the 90s and then going to china a lot in the early aughts i mean he he does start pushing um for both a silk road initiative and, and a eurasian land bridge initiative and um uh he gets a major eight part interview in the people's daily and becomes kind of a big wig, um, in China, uh, um, at least as a, as a foreign influence, um, the equivalent today would be Michael Sandel, who is not, who's just a communitarian, doesn't have any of this, you know, super permission stuff, although it's not particularly left wing, but is also an American super influential in China. Um, but I also point out the time period in which he was operating because we're dealing with the end of the Jimin period. This is a particularly right wing period of Chinese development as well. Um, I mean, formally, I know that the, the CPC doesn't recognize it has ever had a right wing period, but like, right. There were billionaires in the leadership of the party of the party at this time, um, which is not the case now and has not been the case since Hu Jintao. Um, so, this really happens. He starts picking up uh, in 2007. He he starts doing this weird stuff with Occupy, but he does pick up some Democratic p talking points um, and like promoting the you know restoration of Glass Steagall and this that, and the other after the housing crash. But then immediately pivots back right again. Um, and one of the crazy things about this man. Um, uh, he also advocated for a single payer healthcare bill, which, like, I remember reading it and going, "Well, this is actually better than what we're going to get." But again, it seemed like another bait and switch, like the thing that we, the cycle that we saw in the '70s, where 
you had advocation of left wing ideas, pivot right. Uh, you have advocation of right wing ideas, run uh, in the mid 80s, run people for Democratic primaries, get them in office, claim to be a Democrat, mo- remove yourself from, you know, this, this, from being associated with, with uh, the Reagan weird um, missile defense programs. Um, but then he immediately uh, started really pushing um, uh, strange things. So he went from um, single party health care to saying that um, Obamacare was the same thing as Nazis action uh, T4, which was playing into the Tea Party's uh, death panel um, rhetoric at the time. And then he started comparing Obama to Hitler. Um, and also talking about FEMA death camps. So it's just, it, it, you know, and, and he lives for, I mean, he only died in 2019. I think that's another thing people don't realize. I mean, this man was around for a long time, but I do think his death was necessary for the current rebranding because I do not think he would have allowed, um, any association with pro-communist stuff, even superficially the way we've seen with MAGA communism and infrared and, and stuff like that. So let's talk about infrared. And I know, I know people are going to be mad at me about going after infrared. Uh, Maybe not now because it's become more and more obvious, but I remember being skeptical about a year ago for reasons or two years ago, for reasons that I, that I told you, as soon as I started getting a show, a lot of people were like debate has talk about, uh, um, patriotic socialism and patriot communism. And then that was the first branding. And then we get to MAGA communism. And I was like, well, that was predictable. Um, but we talked a little bit about infra has having like a grand theory of everything uh, first resurrecting Lysenkoism, but doing it in a very weird way. Not that anyone should resurrect Lysenkoism, but um, but it was particularly strange how they did it. Um, then, oh, what did they do? Um, well, you started uh, talking a little more about uh, Nick Land and, right. um, you know, kind of bringing that accelerationist, uh, you know, thinking right wing accelerationism was was being brought in again yeah Yeah. uh, which i'd seen before i feel like i see that every few years thank you to losing guitar um i know you didn't mean it but you kind of fucked us up um uh (laughs) yeah well you know um you know haas it you may or may not be the you know the you know the nickname for um you know uh an individual that wrote for the Center for uh, um, New American Research, the Negro, uh, uh, the Reza Negros- Negrosani um, organization. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, he may or may not be that figure known as Adam Tahir that uh, worked with that organization. Um, you know, kind of learning some of that rhetoric, and um, I, you know, I, I, I. I cannot, I cannot prove that, but I've, you know, from what I've, what I've seen, um, his background, uh, kind of seems like he was wanting, um, you know, to, um, express that more like, uh, post Marxist Zizek, Nick Land, um, and kind of tie it all together and say like, you know, we have to hyperstition, communism into being basically um, yeah just... a lot of that um what i used to think of as weird grad student communism um yeah. <laughs> uh which you know I, I as a person who comes out of the fisher sphere of influence in the early aughts aught teens um and I, I i like negrostani's some of negrostani's work but i mean there's a weird there's loopholes in it that's clearly a gateway drug um Nick Land moved to Shanghai, did a lot of meth, and became what he is today uh, through that pathway. Um, and you know, he denies that there's any relationship. But uh, and I say this as a person who was often defending Fisher from accusations that 
that he was a, a crypto right winger because he used some of the same rhetoric. Um, although he was not an accelerationist. Uh, but I, I will say for those who, for everyone who likes capitalist realism, Fisher also was explicitly not a Marxist. Um, he didn't, he was trying to figure out what he was. Um, and in that space, there was a lot of that. There was a lot of equivocation. There's a lot of like a mixture of very good scholarship with very sloppy scholarship. And honestly, I know, I, I know I have a lot more Zizek fans, uh, than probably anyone else, but I, I've always thought that was true for Zizek too, that like there's Zizek books I'll stand and defend, but there's Zizek books where I'm like, you contradicted yourself five times and I don't know what this has to do with Marxism at all. I don't know why we're talking about object oriented ontology. I, I, I frankly don't care. Um, and, uh, um, I remember that, uh, a time period in the teens when I think people were getting kind of fed up with the first, with the third round of the anarchist movement, particularly, um, the way the Graeberite version of it went around Occupy, right. um, that some of these ideas became popular again. And then we saw the birth of American social democracy, um, uh, something that I am, and I, and I guess you are too, profoundly um, of mixed mind about. Um, uh, Yes, it's good that people like socialism again, but it would be really nice if they knew what it was. Right, exactly. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so, um, uh, so we have we have that field of consultation, and like I said, this is also a time period where uh, you have Israel Shamir uh, doing stuff and Counterpunch, blah 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 blah. All this stuff, you know, comes out to light. A couple of things happen. Alice Coburn dies, and Counterpunch kind of cleans up its act. Um, Mark Fisher dies, sadly. Um, but by the time he dies, all the right wingers around him have become fully right wing, and all the left wingers around him uh, double down on their particular forms of politics. Um, um, and then I think the Trump, you know, 2020 happens, Ber Bernie capitulates. We saw the Amy Therese style post leftist go full reactionary um, in a very brief period of time. Um, and, and I think this is still a lot of that same uh, gravitational yeah, pull. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it is too. What I found interesting is it gets, gets weirder and weirder. Um and I remember uh, good old Donald Parkinson writing his LaRouche article and me going, well, it's a good object lesson. You know, it tells us a whole lot now that LaRouche is dead. Uh, but, you know, we'll see it again, but we're not going to see LaRouche again. Clearly, that's over. And, and so I'm going to follow this in their times. Derek has been <laughs> wrong. Um, but what do you think happened? Because I... I I started seeing this stuff trickling in when we started hearing talk about patriotic communism and uh, patriotic socialism and me going, okay, this is odd. Um, and, and it was at the same time where the people around the more hard end of the right were making sure to drop all racial rhetoric, which has been kind of a, kind of a trend since Charlottesville actually is removal of the racial rhetoric promoting particularly Latin and Asian uh, uh, members into leadership, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the, and, you know, per, uh, arguing about Western cultural nationalism or integralism or corporatism, depending on who you're talking about, but not racial nationalism, um, which I find interesting because if you've read someone like, and I have read a lot of the, a lot of these, far right books. If you've read someone like uh, Sam Francis, uh, Sam Francis, who was a, a right racialist, actually thought that white nationalism was a non-starter in the U.S., but that what he thought a counter elite anti um, professional class uh, cultural nationalism 
might be a way to get the ideas mainstreamed um, without without them being racial. And yeah, if we can save the ideas of the right way, see if we can't save all its genetics, fine. Um, which w- it, which was uh, something that was not commonly known about him and became obvious when his book Leviathan and its em- enemies was published, I believe in 2016 and 2017. Uh, by our Ar- 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 Arctos Press, same people who published Dugan, um, and, and Evola, I think. And Evola, uh, most yeah. Evola. Evola yeah. comes from two presses for the most part. Inter Inter Traditions, which is a weird hippie. Right. Well, right, the New Age. Yeah, it's like crystals, astrology, Evola. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yep. And then, and then uh, there's Arctos, which is European New Right, um, Gulam Fe, Alain uh, de de Benist or de Benoist, I don't know how to say his name. Um uh Golden Dawn. Um uh people who hung out with Richard Spencer. <laughs> um uh also Which... Dugan, also Moravola, and interestingly enough though, LaRouche is not explicitly part of that, but they come in the same circles together and that's that's maddening and frightening it's like they kind of uh wait in the background and bide their time for the right moment to uh re-emerge like like little weirdo cicadas and um spread their wings and fly um where are they getting their money from do you know i don't know like (laughs) well you know um you, you know you can you can well one uh you know they've uh, accumulated money over the years through through benefactors, uh, members of the organization that have died, left money to them. Um, they you know recruit um, among a certain class of people. Um, but if we look at their most recent conference, and like I said, a lot of these things you can't, you never get like a smoking gun to find um, exactly where the funding comes in. But they had um, one of their key speakers was um, William Happer. Um, and William Happer, um, admin, uh, member of the uh, Trump administration, uh, George H.W. Bush administration, um, uh, leading climate deniest, uh, denialist, and gets his funding from um, both uh, from the Mercer family and from uh, Coke Industries. Um, so, I mean, usual suspects as far as, you know, the right. Um, and yeah, William Happer. Uh, spoke at the LaRouche conference. He's a, um, a professor emeritus at uh, you know, physics at Princeton University and uh, was appointed director of energy research, the Department of Energy by George H.W. Uh, Bush. Um, and he is a uh, chairman of the steering committee of Jason, um, which is a group of scientists and engineers um, that uh, inform the uh, U.S. government on various issues, um, and you know this is one of the the speakers that they had at the at the Schiller Institute, and I think that um, you know it really speaks to kind of what um, what is as uh, you know behind a lot of this um, is kind of the usual suspects for you know who who promotes um, right wing movements in the United States. Yeah, it, what I find interesting is where you don't find the Schiller Institute, you find its enemy split organization, LaRouche Pack, which is even more right wing than sure. Schiller. Um, so you you know, LaRouche Pack recently has been uh, has oh I don't know, um, like we know for example that LaRouche Pack got about six million dollars from the Heartland Institute and in the in, in 2009-2010 and that we know that it it gave a lot of money to key candidates but it's been involved in like stop the steal stuff and it's been fairly well funded Um, um, now what is the dividing line because I this is unclear to me Uh, how did there become two LaRouche movements and you know basically well you know who 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 runs it, who controls it, you know, you have, uh, you know, two different, you know, have, have Helga, um, who runs the Schiller Institute. Um, and then I think that, um, the LaRouche pack sees themselves as more of the, 
the ideological heirs of of LaRouche. So Helga feels uh, maybe more entitled to deviate from things LaRouche has said um, because, you know, she she knew him personally, whereas, uh, you know, the LaRouche pack is is uh, more just followers of rather than people that were uh, closer to his, you know, his personal life. Right. Uh, um, LaRouche pack maintains the anti-communism uh, more explicitly as well. Right. Like that's like, yeah. this is one of the things where I'm watching MAGA communists who also start defending Lyndon LaRouche. And I'm like, how do you deal with his book? What every conservative should know about communism, which is one of the well, most insane paranoid tirades I have ever read. And he's well, like, cause they'll just say that they're, they're talking about, um, they're talking about leftists. They're not talking about communism. Cause they'll, you know, their, their line is they'll, um, Oh, they, they, they try- use, they use, left communist language to distance them. This is something I noticed with the post left was the appropriation of left communist language to, um, to actually make anti-communist points um, by no, not just going after the Democrats, but going after all quote leftist unquote. Yeah. As... It's all, it's all, um, it's all the, you know, the Rockefeller uh, foundation, um, you know, and, because there are um, legitimate criticisms to make of um, the, you know, uh, the NGO industrial complex and kind of funding totally. that particular, um, you know, left organizations do get um, there, you know, these, these criticisms get legs, but they're only one sided. So you're going to look at, um, you know, where this, this left organization's getting funding, but um you know, you're not, you're not going to look at, um, where William Happer gets his funding. Um, you're going to, um, you're going to say that, um, entryism is, um, wrong. Um, except when we do it with Republicans, except for when we do it with Republicans, because you know, that it's, it's a complete, uh, I called them the bizarro, uh, bizarro DSA for the Republicans, you know, they're, Uh, you know, very similar um, kind of strategic thinking, but we're just going to do a reversal of roles with the same, you know, electoral, you know, dyad that's presented. And, um, you know, just, you know, we're going to decry postmodernists and postmodernism, but then we're going to go with this, like, we're beyond left and right, you know, uh, Nick Land, <laughs> uh, you know, this Delusian influence on it. Like, there's uh, so much that... Um... Yeah, it's right-wing delusionism, too, which I know people... I, I will say this. People need to study the the descendants of... the ideological descendants of Deleuze more because there is a right center and left of it as well. And I think um, it gets a pass other than Land because people don't recognize... Right. Uh, you know, it's comp. It's really, I mean, it's really complex, verbose. Right. You know, uh, it, needless, I would say, needlessly verbose. Deliberately but, devo- verbose well, in an obnoxiously yeah. French way. Like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, yeah. <laughs> and so you know, um, you know, it lends itself to. Um, you can always say, um, you know, it. This this beyond le- left or right rhetoric really easily because we're saying oh we're, no we've we've transcended and we're on this whole meta level now that you know you're 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 in the Anglo box um, you know uh, is yeah. what the uh, the infrared crowd calls it yeah um, I always point out that when when left communists talked about the left of capital. Um, uh, historically speaking, no matter how you feel about them, they at least knew that they were refer- they were not referring to the Soviet Union, even if they thought they were state capitalist um, explicitly. Um, um, and you know, I, my, my whole stance about left communism, which I think kind of pisses most everybody off, is that um, when the USSR fell, like Trotskyism, it doesn't make sense anymore. Like. Um, it, like, I don't know what you, like, what non-capitalist left is there if, if by operating in a capitalist society, you're part of a capitalist left. Um, 
uh, I guess you maybe can argue that there's a non-capitalist left in China, but like they don't do that. So it's uh, when I see that rhetoric now, and it's coming from someone I know is not in one of these left communist organizations, usually a board, a board against organization. To me, it's now a tell they're about to go in another direction. Now I say this as a person who used to use a lot of that rhetoric. Um, I also and I don't yeah. now like um, deliberately. In fact, I started moving away from it admittedly during the Trump administration, not because I was all on the everybody needs to the united front with the Democrats against Trump, but more because I saw people use my rhetoric to move people to the right, even before we had this post left stuff like there were there were alt rightists who would show up and I, they were, it was like whack-a-mole on my Facebook for a while. <laughs> Uh, in like 2014, 2015, who would use my well, you know, com- w- when you complain about liberals and and the ca- and the left of capital, you know, um, it sounds to me like you're, you know, like you're really in line with um, far right politics. And I realized I had a soul searching moment where I was like, yeah, I. I even if I believe some of this, I can't articulate it this way because clearly I don't want to be that. Right. Um, uh, uh, interestingly enough, um, I don't know if you followed the 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 sort of post Marxist communist, um, the Monsieur Dupont uh, and um, nihilist communism and all that stuff. They've had similar turns um, where one of them became more and more right wing and the other one actually sadly becomes more and more concessionary towards like Keynesianism and whatnot in response to the other one moving right. Um, and this is why I've been increasingly advocating, like you got to stick to your guns, like leftists that we don't like and are stupid are still left. They're st- are still part of the same political movement as us in so much as they are not, you know, outright Democrats or liberals or whatever. I don't like what they have to say. Um, but, you know, and I think a lot of them are wrong. Um, but Hazites and whatnot and these neo LaRoucheites, I do not consider leftists anymore. I think they have well, left they would, reservations. They would, they would definitely agree, agree with, with me, that, actually. Yeah, yeah. 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 They would definitely agree with you. And um, I, I think that, um, you know, I don't, I don't use, um, you know, I tried. I used the the left. Um, you know, in a in a very um, like a I guess a goal oriented way. Um, I I think that you know ultimately we're going to find um, people that are more sympathetic um, to uh, to communist ideas among people that identify as the left, and that is a uh, historical uh phenomenon like it's yeah you can say like you know it's a relative left and right is a relative position we turn here flip the mirror and now you know it's the other way around you you know it's it's they have a real historical contingency that we can point to um a historical lineage um that communism is objectively a part of um and it's if not the um the you know the both the goal um, and the the practice um, of the left, and I think that I I can't think of a single historical phenomenon or, or example of somebody, um, you know, using this beyond left and right rhetoric that wasn't just somebody on the right picking up ideas that have been left on the floor and trying to stick them and see what sticks like beyond I, left and right always means right oh i, I cannot <laughs> think of a single a single you know historical example you know we can I mean, you, going you can, all the way back to the national syndicalist movement and uh and and cirque perhune and the proto-national anarchists etc who all claim to be beyond left and right beyond left and right always means right um <laughs> Uh, and that also is 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 uh, that falls into don't let anyone convince you that because socialism was in the Nazis' name that they were leftist. Um, 
And I would say that would also be true for these Larusites and Infahazites, right? Like they aren't on our team. Um, and they make weird bedfellows, but I, and, and to be fair, in some sense, I, I don't think they're, I do think LaRoucheites are dangerous because they've managed to have major effects before. And, you know, like we said, they're crucial to the ideological space of the American right in ways that, that is not immediately obvious and how, unless you dig deep into this stuff. Um, even down to the specific conspiracy theories. But, um, you know, MAGA communism seems to me to be a particularly pernicious thing to deal with because not only does it have all the cult stuff, what it has that LaRoucheism and stuff didn't have is internet parasociality and streaming during COVID. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm being somewhat serious where you had oh, a lot cool. of people with a lot of boredom who can get sink down rabbit holes with someone who can superficially throw all these things together very quickly. And as a person who's interested in classics and science and cybernetics and this and the other, um, I can tell you anyone who can tell you that they're going to make a, a unified field theory out of all that and do it on a stream without reference to key text. They're a demagogue at best. Like that's the best interpretation I'm going to have of them. Um, there's nothing wrong with being interested in all those things, but there's no way you're going to be an expert in all of them enough to come up with a grand unified field theory of like how, Mesopotamian economics and also uh, Christian theology and also uh, Marxism, which we are for, but actually against because Marx was part of the Venetian Brotherhood of Secret Bankers of the British, i.e. the Jews, i.e. the British, maybe even the reptilians. Um, like, like you get this and you get, you get the fact that they, it's another thing I associate with conspiracy theorists is you have so much thrown at you at once with so many different sources that there's nobody on earth who can debunk it by themselves. Um, because there's too many different things you have to deal with. Like, okay, I have to deal with Lysenkoism and I have to deal with, with ancient history and I have to deal with um, Marxist categories of economics. And, and as a person who's actually read a lot of the things that people these people have chopped up, it is still hard to convince people who will get part of a quote and, you know, the quote is real and have it decontextualized with them. And for me, tell them, OK, so you have to read 5000 pages and learn German before you can make this claim. Like, that's not a very to, popular thing. You need thing. to very thoroughly understand both Hegel and Leibniz and, uh, you know, um, and now going into, you know, Marx's attempt to reinvent calculus because of infinitesimals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Like, um, and, and they've solved value form theory and they've solved, um, you know, the, the, every problem that Marxists have argued, uh, for, for, you know, what, 150 years, uh, they they've solved it and they have the solution and the solution um, is to subscribe to their stream. Right. And, um, right. Uh, yeah. Infil that's... Infiltrate the CPUSA, I guess, but not really just make like fake, fake uh, CPUSA accounts um, because that, that is, that is now uh, that project has not worked very well. Yeah, um, then then what was the first one? The the Center for Political Innovation and the Mopanites, which right. these people were associated with, and that's gone the right. way one would expect well, but, it to go. And, and I, but I wouldn't. Um, I would. I would. Um, give... Although Mopin's not a neo Larushite, like oh, he's a well, kind of weird, or is he now? I, like... I, I I feel like they've been working on him for a while, but I don't think that um the, the the center for political innovation itself and the people that were involved in it were all there's that's a was i think a contentious issue um within within um and then among those folks and as well was the um infrared uh drama but as you can see um that organization no longer exists and uh the newest uh turn of things is that um Maupin has come back and uh, put something in his video that that Haas didn't like. So now, um, now Maupin is an enemy of the infrared uh, group, and 
um yeah a lot of a lot of you know uh Maupin had a contrite um not actually contrite but like a video where he uh stood in front of the water um wearing like a, a white sweater and saying that he's very sorry for what he's done um but not really it was really that these people were um you know duplicitous and maybe they were feds and who knows and this kind of thing not really taking responsibility for his own actions um and i think that we've never um, seen that on the left before anyway go ahead yeah um, <laughs> and i think but i i i, I want to um you know uh just um i don't want to say you know defend them uh as a as an ideological you know uh move but i thought i don't think that a lot of the people um involved in cpi were um i think that they were legitimately um interested in socialism and communism just a very you know uh, their own idiosyncratic um you know form and i think that um you know basically that the center didn't hold and um you know that's why you know because uh you know Maupin um would still you know say he's in favor of socialism um but but infrared does not um infrared they're they're like very clearly saying that socialism is is social democracy menshevik uh trotskyist whatever and we're communist with a capital c right um and um but then you know they hate trotskyist but larouche is like a key figure and they hate anarchists, but, uh, love Nick land and, um, you know, yeah. uh, ideological consistency is, is not, um, something that you'll find in any form of the, the old, uh, you know, LaRouche movement or its current iteration. Yeah. It's, this is what people need to understand about internal coherence versus, versus external coherence, because the internal coherence of these are emotional and deep history and lore, but, also, the incoherence is part of the game because if you will accept these incoherent notions, you will accept other notions. And that's, that's I mean, I, I'm not one to scream cult all the time. I'm really not, but it's an old cult tactic right. to, to weed people out by having them believe contradictory things. And if you can't hold that, con which... Which, by the way, it takes a very intelligent person to actually do. Um, gullible, but intelligent, because it requires a massive amount of, uh, of, of resources to, you know, like, like if you've ever argued with, I don't know, uh, one of the Barista Gate people, which, you know, came up with these great things like service workers are not proletariat, which is a stretch. But you can bend uh, theories of surplus value enough and still be a Marxist and kind of make that argument certain Maoists have in the past. Right. Um, it's, I, I actually think a lot of it, uh, you know, it really seems like it. it they took a, um, a third worldist yep. sort of stance, but then uh, like a right wing one. Um, so yeah, it's yeah, like, it's right it's wing like, third wordism. It's, it's like right wing Jay Sakai, but like. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's just yeah. It's it, it like it, it right. The the third worldist stance and, and third worldist stuff about um, productive versus non productive labor and and hyper exploitation. And then, however, <laughs> um, Korean shopkeeper petty bourgeoisie, however, right, are yeah. proletariat. Which I was just I, I was like, okay, I see how you can torture. There is a surplus value for the third world. This weird argument that you made, but now that you're pairing it with this one, you're literally arguing that the boss of of the that the uh, the small business owner of the small coffee chain is a proletariat, but their employees aren't. Yeah, That's they're, where they're we're employee, at. The employees actually they see they they called them rentiers. Yeah, um, I, that the um, logo logo Daedalus, that was his uh you know the yeah. as someone who talks about rentierism as a major problem in our economy it made me real mad because i'm like now no one's gonna know what i'm talking about like, yeah. <laughs> like... i 
and and I you know I just want to say that um, Starbucks has spent a lot of money on mm-hmm. former CIA um, agent intelligence agents uh, to serve as Pinkertons um, for their anti uh, you know current anti union um, push and. Um, you know, I just I, I question the motivations of people um, who want to um, who very like adamantly make their focus disrupting um, unionization efforts. You know, I, I don't think that anybody thought that um, Star Wars or Star Wars Starbucks uh, workers unionizing was going to be. Um, like the the Bolsheviks, um, that was going to be the the domino that pushed everything down. But um, a general trend towards uni- unionization, um, you know, is is happening, um, and they're working on making these distinctions so that they can speak to a ideal, platonic ideal of the worker um, that has more in common with like like. Uh, Junger, like this, like conservative socialism of um, like German yeah, Junger, Prussian Singer, socialism, yeah. right? Um, then that's it what does it reminds anything. me of, honestly. Really, yeah, and I and I right. and I think that that is that is. I mean, Haas has done a stream on the conservative revolution and held those figures up, so it's more very explicitly where um, people at the core of this are drawing from. Um, it's just, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, go as far to the periphery with the sort of parasocial dimension where you get a lot of folks that are, um, wanting to, uh, you know, have a, a meme ideology that they can swing like a, you know, a hammer and smash down liberalism. Um, but, you know, they, it's only, only liberalism is the only thing they oppose. Right. And, only uh, cultural liberalism, not economic liberalism, yeah, because they're, they're economic liber- liberalism. They're, yeah, they're the libertarians. Way. Yeah, uh, it reminds so- me. Of, it's like MAGA communism is Dingus aesthetics and some Dingus programmatism, um, Larucheism, and like spiked. If you know the history of spiked in the UK, yeah. like, like it's very similar. It also has similarly weird, like associations with uh weird nationalist movements and i just this comes up well, again well i mean again they, again. they that's that's they've they've ran the course on um who they can um pull from the left and now more explicitly are uh calling for groipers and um you know up, trying to appeal to um you know doing streams about how andrew tate's son of a CIA agent sex trafficker is based or uh, Nick Fuentes. Um, these are like the figures that they see as their target audience. Um, yeah. Yep. That, and, that, yeah. So they are our alt-right. Yeah. They're, what? they're, they're the current iteration of the alt-right, which is, is, it's funny because now they can, they can differentiate themselves from the last iteration. Cause if you look at Richard Spencer, he, he was vote, he's pro Biden, you know, um, and he's also, you know, uh, a, um, you know, Euro, Europe, Europeanist, you know, mm-hmm. he, um, you know, is, believes in a strong NATO and, um, believes you know, a strong it, NATO it's... believes in a strong European union. Um, like in fact, he would argue with other far rightists from Europe about the need for a European union because it was a trans right project, which, which, hilariously was one of to me was like oh you almost convinced me that the european union was worse than i thought um <laughs> like uh it's like i don't want the Euro- no bad um uh but yeah it's it's interesting to see this come up over and over and over again um and one of the reasons why i i, I talked to you is uh you you know you have never believed any of this but you were in circles where they were able to pull from even more than me. Like they, there was an attempt here on Varm blog for Hazites. In fact, they got chased out of my discord. Um, but. Um, well, initially I saw, I saw, um, I didn't see it as, as a, as a negative to begin with. I, you know, I, I 
I saw the surface level of it, um, which is, I, I think, what I, I, they wanted me to see. You know, they wanted people to see that surface level and say, oh, yeah, well, I'm, you know, I'm anti-imperialist. So, yeah, and Democrats um, suck and agree. We agree. Like, like. Right. And, and this is on the tail end of um, the post left, um, which I, you know, was also uh, you know, on the edge of, but never really associated with, but um, tangentially had a lot. They had... liked me until they hated my guts, the post left, kind of yeah. the way the Eula Rishites are with you. <laughs> like, yeah. Um... Yeah. Uh, uh, very, very similar. Um, I'm sure this, uh, we'll see clips of this video um, now uh, among both, both the organization or both groups, maybe. But, um, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, um, I saw, you know, that as, um, as, you know, it was what they're trying to sell now, which is that, oh, the, you know, we're an anti, we're anti-war, we're anti-imperialist. Why do you love war? Why do you love imperialism? Because you're opposing us. And that's the only thing that matters when we are, you know, we are the, the, the fighting force of this. We are the partisans of this. Um, and you see this now, um, with, um, um, my battery on my laptop's about to go to um uh, with some of the um current larouche figures are going around and they're um <clears throat> you know they're disrupting kind of uh, establishment democrat politicians um with good cause i mean i i i, I see um but um it's you know you're a larouche member you know interrupting mike pompeo you know i you know, yeah, screw Mike Pompeo, but um, you support Trump, who appointed Mike Pompeo. Yep. Um, yep. So they want what they would say is that, well, it's, um, you know, uh, you know, Trump appointed some people and they maybe they would give the Kanye speech like, I don't want to say, you know, what kind of people he appointed, but, you know, I'll say it, you know, uh, you know. <laughs> The British, no. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but that that you know, it's all you know. Oh well, he you know he would he would have been anti-imperialist, but he had these these figures that were pushing him. Um, but you know, they 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 push Marjorie Taylor Greene now, who is one of the most virulent anti-China, anti-communist, wants total complete war with China. And you know they're Similar posting. Similar with Tucker Carlson, who will you know, like Tucker Carlson who, will say the, some good things on Ukraine every now and then, but but it, that's because they want to they want to shift the resources that are being used on Ukraine and China, and they think that Russia, as a white Christian nation, um, is obviously an ally that they can have against China, which was the original you know Duganist line in the eighties and nineties, um, and you know that. I, I think that um, that's going to come more to the front, especially, um, you know, like I was, I mentioned earlier with China, with ecological civilization, as China um, fails to be um, Trump, is Trump enough for them. Um, you know, the, the, the center is not, is not holding. Um, and it's almost you know, like they read the liberals critiques of G uh, of G. I mean, you know, I have some critiques of G too, but the liberal critiques of G and like, we're like, yeah, but we like based. it. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's exactly. <laughs> the, the, the liberal critique of communism um, <laughs> and of the Republican party. Cause like the liberals uh, saying like Trump's a communist who loves, you know, he loves Russia and he's you know, like taking all of that, but then being like, yeah. And it's based. And like, <laughs> Uh, just uh, like to say, bizarro, bizarro DSA for the Republicans. Yeah, uh, that that that's what gets me about it. Is like, I, I recently did a video on varieties of tailism, and I'm like, they're both tailism. They're both even tailism from my perspective to the right. But the one that's claim that's calling the others tailless is actually tailing a more right wing faction of society. Right. It's like. It's it's just the bad stuff about liberalism. It's none of the good stuff about liberalism. And and yeah, I mean, yes, we cultural liberalism can be super fucking annoying. It can't like I'm not gonna lie. I've been, you know, I went to college 
I know what that's like. It made me into a paleo conservative, actually. Like I, I've actually gone through the steps that a lot of these people have gone through. Um, um, well, uh, you know that that does speak to I think the 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 age of a lot of the people. Um, bingo. You know, it's it's they they were not around twenty years ago. You know they were literally not around twenty years ago. Right. So they don't see the progression to what it is now, and so they what they've seen their whole life is uh you know what obama era and then trump came and disrupted it in their eyes um even though these were all it was really you know there was much of a continuation between the policies the... Of, of obama to trump to biden um you know you really have a lot of you know a continuity um in the policies they they weren't there um and don't have any frame of reference for um, you know, the, the fact that it's both of these parties are, are right wing conservative parties. Um, and so they, they think that if they're opposing, you know, uh, what's the current power that it's, it's like the, that you beyond left and right. Oh, and we're. Nope. We'll see if Johnny comes back. I can edit this. Well, um, on that note, oh, here we go. All right, so I, John has returned um, on his cell phone. I'm gonna let uh, let me get your uh, closing notes out. Yeah, I just uh, here. Let me get. Yeah, there, there we go. Okay. Burp, burp, yeah. Burp. So, uh, yeah, my battery died on my cell phone or on my uh, laptop. So sorry about that. No problem. Um, I can edit. I can edit that little. It wasn't very long, but I can edit it out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what I'm, you know, um, I kind of lost my train of thought with that. Um, oh, beyond left and right, you was your last word. So we get to, you're opposing the current order and you end up beyond left and right. And they're 14 right. um, or 20. And, and so, yeah, they're, they're <laughs> um, you know, they're teenagers and they, they just see it as, um, you know, being anti-establishment, um, which is a really easy frame or, you know, this kind of really basic populism um and not you know um really having you know they haven't done the work they haven't they haven't read um you know a lot of the the people that they um you know they're they're talking about they're just getting into reading these figures and they're having and they're them, having them know, introduced told. to them through people like us um but worse yeah like <laughs> right <laughs> um you know and and you know it it's um there's a, a certain, um, uh, I hate to use verbose French words, but there's a certain uh, jouissance behind, you know, this, like, this impulse of um, just uh, having, um, you know, a purely destructive force of, um, to, to smash liberalism, you know, just, just taking that quote, like, communism, you know, is the movement to change the present um state of things but really you know they're they're don't realize that they're upholding you know the the present state of things um even more so than you know the social democrats that they that they criticize um you know we're saying that landlords and uh you know uh f farmers that uh are petit bourgeois are actually the equivalent of like chinese peasantry um, and then trying to, to make these really, uh, really crude um, analogies um, to, you know, to Maoism, um, 
really crude versions of of stageism um, that enables this uh, this idea of uh, neo feudalism. Uh, so if you if you, you've you've regressed to neo feudalism, then you need to move forward into capitalism by accelerating uh, you know these like libertarian policies. Um, and I think that's that's what the the core of a lot of the this ideology is 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 it's the next form of anarcho capitalism. I mean it's it's the sort of uh, new new um, dress that these uh, you know um, I don't it's not even libertarian because all the only like decent parts of libertarianism they shaved off and. Um, yep, it's all the bad stuff. <laughs> like, like it, no, no. <laughs> um, I guess they still maintain some nominal anti-imperialism, but only only right now. And so it's right. interesting to see where that goes. Um, I, to me, the MAGA communism was like the and as farce because that took all the the plausible deniability of patriotic socialism was removed with that. Yeah. Um, well, I think that um, a lot of the people that were more earnest um, have fallen off with that. And so that's that's part of why the, the, the it has shifted is because the um, the people that were, um, you know, were actually concerned with, um, you know, a communist socialist future um, and actually, you know, um, you know, have like a core belief in, in these ideas um, have fallen to the wayside, which is why, you know, it's not even, it's not even feasible for them to maintain allies with like Caleb Maupin or um, even these sort of ostensible, you know, figures on the side that um, because they have, uh, they've doubled down and it's just going to continue to be a doubling down and, um, you know, like you, you take the most outlandish ideas um, and if you can buy into that, then you'll buy into, you know, if you think that dinosaurs didn't exist, then, you know, MAGA communism is going to be, you know, a pretty easy sell for you. Um, you know, it's, it's because you're, you're open to, you know, you got your mind so open that your brain fell out. <laughs> Just, yep. Yep. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on. Um, uh, I know we were all over the place today, but as general tendencies, this is a good thing to note. And uh, if someone tries to sell the roof to you, you should run. Just run. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, they're 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 out there. They're going to be more and more visible. Um, and you know, they will you know ostensibly you know maybe take some good positions here or there. But um, we, you know, can't um, ignore like what that's actually coming from um, and where, more importantly, where it's it's heading to. Um, I think I think that's a good stopping point. Yep. All right. And we're out. <laughs> The United States is in a state of confusion and surprise. We fear this. We fear that they have something out that the majority of the people don't know about. They will run to the house, let them have very good hot flesh. Now I'll show you a photo. Now I'll show you a photo. Pent up feelings that, that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers. Get a lot of killers. Why well, you think our country's so innocent? But I won't attack it.